Thank you, Dr. Malati. It was wonderful and remarkable experience for us. Now I would like to introduce Dr. George Arvind, Vice Chairman of Sun Group Schools, Velu Ran Chennai. Dr. Arvind has spent few months in Finland and USA to study the school education systems in detail and bring in best practices to the Indian system of education. Dr. Arvind strongly believes in the integration of technology into learning to make it fun and holistic. He currently manages five school campuses and constantly strives to bring in innovation into our education system and strongly believes that change is the only constant. Dr. Arvind, please join us to share your strategies for STEM success at school. Thank you. A very warm good evening to all of you. I'm sure you've had very productive uh, two workshops. Thanks to uh, Brian and uh, Ms. Bratzel for that. I just spoke to a couple of my faculty who are here for the training as well. So they've said good things. You've probably opened up their minds to try and expand what we already have with the different sets that uh, uh, you guys at LEGO have provided us. Uh, and I also... Uh, want to appreciate EduTech for the opportunity to talk to you guys and also congratulate them on bringing in this conference to India this year. So at the outset, um, as Brian said, uh, I was the only one who is the non-smiley duck making guy sitting in the front. But that was only because I was sitting there and frankly wondering what I was going to say to you all people here because technically I'm not a domain expert. So what I'm going to uh, do is try and look at uh, uh, STEM and STEM strategies as such from the perspective of uh, the management or the top management of uh, uh, of schools in India, you know, from the India perspective and also touch upon a few of the strategies that I actually found and think could make a difference and also uh, maybe delve a little bit into the India conundrum which uh, basically and the education which also Malti was talking about the difficulty in bringing in uh, you know, uh, value addition in education, especially with things like robotics. And, and, and as a pretext to that is the fact that education as such is in the concurrent list and therefore you have a multitude of boards and you also have different states having their own curricula with regionalism and language and a whole bunch of things playing politics inside as well. So what really is STEM success? How do you define STEM success? Is it about competitions and winning them? Is it about the process as such? Is it about the end result? So that's a very important and pertinent question that you should kind of ponder upon, all of you that's involved in this whole process. I frankly don't have the answer to that. So the point of the question was not to answer that. I'm still trying to figure out what really is STEM success? All right, so let's do this. Let's imagine a um, triangle, right? So with three apices, there's a triangle. So on each of them, student, teacher, and parent. Are you imagining the triangle? Whose responsibility do you think it is to ensure that the child has a desired learning outcome? Anyone care to venture? Or is it all of them? Is it two of them? What is it? Yeah, that's what I, I, I figured, you know. Saying all of them is probably the safest answer as well but but i realized that when you when you look at it um, a little more deeply it's the student's responsibility to make sure he or she actually has the learning outcomes that he or she desires but it's very different today in a practical uh, setting here because the parent is paying fees to the school and they figure hey i'm giving you money you better teach my kid and then the teacher is kind of frustrated because she or he has so much work that they want the parent to kind of chip in and the student sometimes really doesn't give a damn about learning. Or sometimes when they do, they think it's the teachers and the parents kind of have to, you know, collaborate and make them learn. So the responsibility to learn uh, uh, is the students. It's something that we need to instill in our kids. And that actually starts at kindergarten. And I was, uh, I was actually surprised and I was very happy that uh, LEGO has kindergarten kits that we have also have in all of our campuses. So the, the point of this is, at an average age of about eight years old, a kid is actually very fascinated about STEM. At that point, they understand the basics of it, they can work on kids, and therefore it's about that eight-year uh, period. 
And the challenge today that we have is making them from technology users, you know. Today, kids are born into using smartphones and tablets. So the biggest challenge that we have is from making them move towards being just an end user or technology consumer to becoming someone who creates and becomes an innovator. So that link between engineering, technology and entrepreneurship, which is the desired end result, is something that's actually missing in India. I won't say completely, but it definitely is missing in India. So on that, on, on, in this context, I think Brian was uh, showing us, and one of the first points he made was uh, that fun is the key driver of education. That's so aptly put. You know, the whole, uh, and he also showed us the Lego Ferrari, the retail one, and also the, uh, the working model that could teach you concepts of physics. So that, so I immediately, gamification came to my mind. So, which is also the rage now, you know, kids want to play and learn and gamification is at the center of that. There was one more thing he said, the um, uh, simple example of what is two plus two and then going on to say, how do you arrive at four? So that fundamental change of looking at things in, 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 in pedagogy as such in India is something that we definitely need to focus on. All right, so I'm going to jump on to a uh, few of the challenges that I think we have and also uh, offer you very little information on strategies as such because I think you guys know more than me. I'm just at the top managing things. So challenges, uh, to my mind, uh, you have the traditional challenges of infrastructure and funding, which is a problem that we have. And I'm not talking in terms of uh, the, uh, the Ivy League private schools in India or any private school in general because now you have the pressure of... Uh, when your competitor has a robotics lab, you, you have to have a robotics lab. You know, that much of value addition that's there and the parent wants maximum value. So infrastructure and funding talking about in the aspect of uh, a pan-India perspective with government schools as well, it's definitely a challenge. Number two is the limited knowledge and expertise that is available today when we're talking about STEM education because it's, India is a country that's still very much in the nascent stages of expanding basic education in itself. So STEM is an even bigger challenge. And I, I think I read somewhere about the statistics that in government schools, only less than one in five teachers are actually trained. And no, I'm not talking about STEM training, basic teacher training as such. So forget STEM. Training by itself is a serious problem that we have. <coughs> Coming up to the evergreen problem of population. 1.3 billion people, 350 million students, very difficult proposition. So the, I think uh, Mr. Christopher was talking about the quantity and quality debate in education in the morning when he was talking about it as well. So with such a great population, how do you make access to education possible for that uh, uh, great big population is also a very important aspect that you need to ponder upon and, and that's when inequality comes in as well like I mentioned. In a total of 1.4 million total schools you have about 23 to 25 percent private schools. So a large section of India is actually going to government schools. You know that's a great section that uh, is ignored and which uh, right now the government is doing great things with it, uh, ex extending STEM, but that again is a huge challenge. Last, the most important, I think, is being able to show short-term tangible results with STEM education. And what I mean by that is getting the parents on board. You got to show them results so they can get on board. So that's another challenge when you're trying to make it an acceptable uh, phenomenon, STEM education in schools. I want to jump into a few interesting strategies. Uh, one is actually the project-based learning uh, which Ms. Bratzel so uh, clearly explained to us in the morning how it works and um, you know the entire collaboration and uh, the unique idea, the broadly defined product, all of that which she so clearly explained. One thing that I found interesting and useful um, in, in the context of the fact that we're so much of, a, an, of an exam model focused system and a little bit too scientific for my liking with, a uh, you know, under emphasis on ethics, the quintessential questions of what's right and wrong, good and bad, technically sometimes what's right is not necessarily good. 
So uh, on that context, I found something interesting called challenge-based learning, which is you know stem through challenge-based learning. So I'll give you an example: the the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals of 2030. So you have a whole bunch of goals, and to be you know for nations in a global level to do that. So how does this fit in? So let's say zeroing poverty, zeroing hunger. You take all of these challenges and actually work at problem. Uh, Take these challenges and problems and work on solutions. And what that does basically, it broadens uh, kids' horizons on thinking about not just academics, but also what's going on in the world and what's important. Because when they get out of school and they're in their lives, these are issues that matter and they should know about is something I believe in. Another one was place-based education. So what is place-based education? So you're basically taking the location of the place and also leveraging it, and not just technology, but your environment and the place where you are, to leverage that into personalized and customized learning. An example would be, uh, let's say, a school garden visit, where you have AR and VR, augmented and virtual reality being incorporated into it, and also, let's say, uh, an interdisciplinary subject learning aspect, where you, where you learn about plants, basically covering biology, but you also write a poem when you're going through it. So there's an interlinkage between the subjects as well, which was another interesting uh, find for me. So with STEM, how it came about initially, I think in the 1800s with uh, Harvard 10, and then moved on to uh, being uh, inquiry-based and child-focused. So right now in schools, what's happening is it's becoming an add-on course. So basically, there is a lack of integration with the academic rigor and the curriculum of what exists. And when you're bringing in a STEM uh, 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 aspect to it, it becomes more like an add-on math course. So that's, that's something that we really need to look into to bring in that streamlining of that curriculum so that it, it, it uh, serves the purpose for, uh, you know, the whole reason of bringing in STEM. And how do you do that? So you've got to teach doing to start off because at the heart of every stem program like i said initially is the creation of a product so the creation of a product has to be at the heart and you need to teach that doing two allow creativity and i say allow with an emphasis especially in india because we basically stifle innovation in schools all of the teachers and all of us educators so you need to allow innovation STEM, when it's equated with innovation, but then, like I said, bumps with your other yardsticks of school education, like your boards, your competitive exams, your multiple streams of um, different uh, competitive exams for a career. So in that aspect, um, how do you make sure that STEM bridges that divide? You add art into it. So you go from STEM to STEAM. So what happens when you add art to it, you bring in the creativity rubric, the out-of-box thinking which we saw in so many of the videos that we saw in the morning. So you need to incorporate art into that. And what STEAM does is it focuses on design to solve real-world problems and gives children the, uh, the ability to not just confine to only STEM but also use art to accentuate that. And another one of the... Uh, Three, the strategy is moving from group work to teamwork. So I think Ms. Bratzel was uh, talking to, to us about collaboration in the morning and how she has rules in her classroom on how you work on your, uh, uh, on your workshop. So that's very important because I feel there is a lot of group work going on and it really needs to be translated into teamwork. And the assessment part which has to be about not on the end result or the product, but the process itself and the child's ability to understand it and kind of give a logical explanation to it. Because at the end of it, when you're questioning things and when you're learning and you're truly understanding it, is when you can solve problems and that's the basis of entrepreneurship, which is what we're all trying to accomplish. So STEM is a global issue and a need of the hour. We've discussed that. There's a whole bunch of countries who are doing different things. Singapore has them embedded within their curriculum. Finland has a field trip approach to do it. The US has the interlinkages of the poem and the uh, plant learning on the field visit that they do. And um, uh, the, the entire um, career platform of kids is going to be very different from what it is today. 
So in India, we have, what's the problem with India? In India, we have the best of brains, but too focused on exams. And the, which, which basically limits your innovation and problem solving capacity as such. So apart from all of the technicalities and the, and the uh, strategies that we can use and the collaborative effort that, um, that we do, basically it's, it's not just about the teachers in that place, it's also about ed tech companies, education businesses and higher education institutions as well. We're trying and doing that. And at the end, what we really need is what the government is doing now, the Make in India mission the Atal Innovation Mission, the Tinkering Labs. Now the state is actually moving towards that and giving us a roadmap as to where we should take STEM education towards. So I believe we need a holistic vision and a guiding path, but with all of the stakeholders involved in it, and also to take into account the vast diversity of the country so that you have a guiding vision but you also have the capacity to tinker it around to all the 633 districts and not just the 30 states of the country to make STEM a success because we definitely want to produce more innovators and entrepreneurs that go out of India and don't have to unlearn and relearn, but rather just learn and do it from when they're going out of school here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arvind, for sharing your strategies with us.